of your City Walk Now host tonight, and I wanna be the first person to welcome you here online with our service. We're gonna get started in just a few minutes with our service, but before we do, I wanted to highlight a few features that are available with you as you engage in our service online. The very first thing is that we love online service because you get to talk throughout the entire service over in the chat box. So go ahead and try it out. Let us know where you're watching from. Another feature that it's available to you is if you click the request prayer button, we'll actually have one of our hosts connect with you privately and be able to pray over whatever prayer request you might have. Another thing, if you wanna connect even deeper with our church, we really recommend that you go to your app store and download the CityWalk app. You'll find sermon notes, you'll find all of the things that you need to stay up to date with our gathering. Finally, we would love for you to be able to connect with us. If you are a first time guest or you've been here for a few weeks, go ahead and press that connect button and fill out a little bit of information. We would love to get to know you a little bit better. We're gonna get started in just a couple minutes, like I said, but go ahead, don't be afraid to chat in that area, click all the buttons and explore, get comfortable, and we're gonna begin our service in just about two minutes. Church, why don't you go ahead and stand with us as we worship here? Good to see you all.
tonight on City Walk Now. My name is Asher Del Bono and I'm going to be your host this evening. Now, we would love to connect with you a little bit further and just chat with you. And so me and a few others, we're just hanging out in the chat box down below. So feel free just to shoot us a message either now or throughout tonight's sermon. And we would love to connect with you and see how your day's been going. Now, if this is your first time joining us, first of all, welcome. I am so excited that you're here and we'd love to be able to connect with you just a little bit further after tonight's service. Now, don't worry, it doesn't mean we're gonna ask you for some personal information and show up at your doorstep or anything, but we'd love to be able to just to send you a quick message. So, easy way to do that, all you need to do is just click on the connect button right above me, fill out some simple information, and one of us will be in contact with you shortly afterwards. I also wanna let you know about a great resource that's available to you, and that is our CityWalk app. The CityWalk app is free and it's available on Android or iPhone. All you need to do is just go into your app store, search for CityWalk Church, get that downloaded to your phone, and there you're going to have access to sermon notes um, as well as a Bible and be able to stay connected with CityWalk Church throughout the week and find out everything that's going on. So with that being said, let's go ahead and get on back to the service and I'll see you guys at the end.
Jesus was forsaken So I will never be His grace is my salvation The gift of God The work of Calvary It is done It is finished Christ has won He is risen Grace is here Love is strong Good morning, City Walk Church. How are we doing today? Thank you all for being here. Thank you for joining us in person. It's great to have a full crowd here today. If you're joining us online, thank you for being here tonight as well, live at 6 p.m. Uh, if you're there, please uh, take advantage of some of the cool features we have online. Our City Walk Now campus has some chat features. You can connect with people live while you're watching the service. I bet right now someone will comment something and saying hello. Good job. Yes. All right. So thank you again for joining us, no matter where you're at. If you don't know me, my name is Rob Haberly. I am the director of guest experience here at CityWalk Church. Normally on any given Sunday, 
I'm out front somewhere running around in the front, in the lobby, in the back, somewhere, making sure that you have the best experience possible. Every once in a while, they let me get up here and talk. And as you can tell by the way that I am staggering my breathing and kind of moving back and forth a little bit, I get nervous. So bear with me, um, but it's glad to be up here. I am glad to be up here with you today. Um, a little background on me. I grew up in Gridley, just up the road. If you're here in person, you probably know where Gridley is, have probably passed through it, probably blinked and you missed it. That's Gridley. That was my hometown. If you're watching online, you have no idea where Gridley is, and that's okay. Uh, Google Sacramento and go north an hour, and you'll find it. Growing up in Gridley was awesome. I know it's a small town, but I enjoy growing up in a little town of about 5,000 people on a tiny little street at the last house on a dead end street on the edge of the town. It was great. And in that little house, in that little community, on any given day during the summer, uh, we would play um, tons of different games with our friends. Our favorite game as we were little was hide and go seek. Some of you are probably familiar with this game. It's a pretty basic concept. Most of you go hide, one of you is it, and the goal is for that person to seek and find everybody else. Lots of fun. When you have about a half a dozen kids in the community playing, it's even more fun. The whole neighborhood becomes a huge playing field. It was great. As we got older, though, uh, hide and go seek became a little bit too simple for us, so we graduated to capture the flag. Anybody like capture the flag? I'll be honest, even as an adult now, I like capture the flag. It is fun. At the time, I was considered an expert, if I do say so myself, at capture the flag. The goal of capture the flag, if you're not familiar with it, you've got two teams. You each have your side. You want to cross the line, grab the flag without being caught, and get back to your base. And that's how you win. My area of expertise was hiding. I was the definition of what you would call stealth. Right next to where I lived, we had a walnut orchard. In that walnut orchard, playing, playing capture the flag was great. Now, if you transition that game to midnight on the weekend, you can't see a thing. You've got a bunch of 10, 12, 15-year-old kids running around the orchard trying to hide from each other and capture the flag. It is awesome. People are running into trees, tripping over each other. I don't believe we ever had a broken limb, but we got pretty close a few times. But again, hiding. So I would get across the enemy line. I get down to an army crawl, find the nearest walnut tree, hide behind the tree, which was easier back then than it would be now. But find the walnut tree, I would climb up in the walnut tree, and nobody would find me. Stealth. But, but you know what? My team didn't always win. As good as I was as, as hiding, that really wasn't the point of the game. The point of, the point of capture the flag is to get the flag and get back to your base. But if all I did was hide, well, good for me, but it didn't help my team at all. We ended up losing. Now, doing more than hiding carries over to, to more than just playing games as a kid. There's life lessons we can learn out of that. Moving up the chain at work. If you want to move up the chain at work, get that next promotion, you can't just sit back and avoid work. You've got to perform. If you're out there dating, and for the record, I am so glad I'm not out there anymore. But if that is you, and God bless you in your efforts, but if that is you, you can't just sit at home and just wait for Mr. and Mrs. Wright to come and knock on your door. You've got to put yourself out there. Teenagers, if you want to excel in school, rumor has it there's some finals or something like that coming up. If you want to do a good job, you can't just sit back and hide from your homework. You've got to study. You've got to perform. You've got to apply yourself. Now, with all of these examples, and so many more that are out there, the answers to success are not found in hiding. The answers to success are found in putting forth a genuine effort to seek your goal. And you'll find it. But therein lies the question, what is the goal? What should I seek? Where do I start? What comes first? I can't focus on everything, at least not at once. I can't focus on, on dating, well, I don't know, but I couldn't focus on dating or moving up the chain of work and doing my school all at the same time because I'm going to get it lost somewhere. It's too much to take on. So where do I start? Which way do I go? 
And I'm sure we've all been at that point before, stuck at that fork in the middle of the road, not sure which way to turn, and feeling kind of lost. What do I seek? So I find myself at this existential fork in the road about 20 years ago. My entire life, up till I was about 21, 22, I was raised in the LDS church, in the Mormon church. I found myself at one point in West Texas with scorpions and rattlesnakes, out knocking on doors, talking to people about the Book of Mormon. Saying, here, there's something you should, you should hear about. And having some good conversations. It was on one of those days that I found myself at a fork in the road that I never even saw coming. I knocked on a door, guy opened the door, we had about a five minute conversation, things were going pretty well, and then he stopped and he says, you know what? You look, you look like a pretty smart guy. Let me ask you a question. Being very proud of myself, I said, I am a smart guy, go ahead. <laughs> so he asked me, he says, have you ever considered the fact that you might be wrong? No, no I hadn't. i have been raised in this my entire life. I knew that this was right because it was all I had never known. And then he continued. He saw the look on my face, I'm sure. He continued and said, there are hundreds of religions out there. This is the one thing that you've dedicated your whole life to and you've never even considered the fact that there's more out there. What if you're wrong? Hello, fork in the road, wow. I didn't know what to do with that information. I finished my two years out there in Texas, came home, and I thought, I'm gonna give this one last try. I'm gonna really focus down, bear down, but that seed of doubt was there. I couldn't do it. And it was a growing feeling of, you know what? What if I'm wrong? What if I should be looking somewhere else? But where do I go? Where do I start? I'm at that fork in the road, and there are dozens of choices of where to go. Now what? So I did what a lot of people would do. I gave up. I'm not gonna take any of them. I'm just gonna sit here at the fork of the road. At, every, at some point in my life, the right, the right road will become apparent to me. I knew that life had answers. I just didn't know where to find them. I decided it was easier to hide from my frustration, to hide from being lost, and not seek anything. Maybe you know what that's like. Maybe you've been there before. Maybe you're even there now. Maybe you're stuck at that same fork in the road, knowing that the right answer is down one of these paths, but not knowing which way to turn. If that describes you even in the slightest, you're not alone, don't worry. God, in all of his wisdom, understood that we would all be at that same fork in the road at some point in our lives. Stuck at the fork in the road, knowing that one direction would lead to happiness and success and the other to possible utter failure. He knew it so well that in one of his first documented sermons, he spoke precisely about this very topic. Regardless of the situation, regardless of the struggle, regardless of the problem, life's answers are found in seeking God first. Plain and simple, life's answers are found in seeking God first. I know you're sitting there, you're sitting back on your couch thinking, Rob, it can't be simple. That can't be the answer to all my problems. Simply put, yep, it is. But as much as I believe it, you don't have to take my word for it. We're going to see what the Bible has to say about it today. But before we get there, let's go ahead and pray. God, I thank you. I thank you for the rocky roads of our pasts. I thank you for the struggles because it's in those times that your path and your way become clear, God. I pray that, God, that you'll be with us this morning, that you would touch our hearts, open our minds, and that your words speak to us in whatever way you would have it to. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so today we are in the book of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 31 through 33. I know we're only focusing on about three verses today, but I've cut it down to about an hour and a half, so we should have you out of here by dinner time. Um, <laughs> so, Matthew 6, 31 through 33 says, So don't worry 
saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. Okay, so before we dive in here, let's take a step back and see what brought us to this point in the Bible. Matthew 6 finds us near the beginning of Jesus' ministry. At this point, he's been baptized. He's fasted in the wilderness for 40 days. He's begun choosing his disciples. He's begun teaching and healing. And it's gotten to the point now that the word's getting out on Jesus. People are talking about him. Hey, have, have you heard of this guy? This, this Jesus fella? He's got a pretty good message. And he's performing miracles on top of it. He made that one guy walk. Let's go see what he has to say. So in the social media of his time, Jesus was completely and totally trending. Much like social media, the younger generation, they thought he was pretty cool. They started following him around. The older generation, eh, verdict's still out. We'll see what it turns out. But Matthew even puts it in, in chapter 4. He says, his fame spread throughout all Syria. Throughout all Syria. Now, I grew up in Gridley, a small little town. It didn't take long for word to get out. But Jesus' reputation spread throughout all Syria. That's without internet, without phone, without any sort of communication other than by word of mouth. This guy was trending. And how did he respond to that fame? He gained followers. People became his followers. In a short period of time, his followers skyrocketed. We're talking about thousands of people literally following, following Jesus around the countryside. It's pretty impressive. So Jesus decided, I should probably take advantage of the situation. He went up the mountain a little bit, he turned around, and he preached. That brings us up to Matthew 5. He preached all the way from Matthew 5 all the way through Matthew 7. He preached about life. He preached about caring for the poor, praying and fasting, prioritizing our lives, and his approach to all these things was exactly the same. Do these things for the right reasons. It's not about being recognized for being holy or for being righteous. It's about your growing relationship with God. It's not saying, hey, look at me, look how great I am. As Chris Dowdy shared a few, uh, a few weeks back, it's about the heart. It's about quietly and humbly working on yourself and your relationship with God. Coincidentally, if you want to check out Chris's message, it's available online, as all of our other sermons are. I was back a few months ago in our sermon series about David. And it ties in well with this, because it's about the heart. It's about searching for God and working on yourself. Now, in the middle of this message in Matthew, Jesus acknowledges the fact that it's not going to be easy. He knows that life is going to be full of distractions. There's going to be temptations. We're going to get our priorities backwards. And the, it's going to seem that the wants and the desires of this life are going to feel like they have to be sought after just in order to survive. Even more so if you want to succeed in this life. Knowing that, this is what he says. He says, don't worry, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? Or what will we wear? Eat, drink, or wear. We're not talking about a promotion at work. We're not talking about a new car. We're talking about pretty basic necessities. If I think back to Miss Nichols' class in sixth grade up in Gridley, food, water, and clothing were kind of some important things that you needed to survive in life. I'm sure what Jesus meant to say in this was, make sure you have your food, make sure you have something to drink, please, please put on some clothes. And then after that, we can focus on everything else. That makes more sense, doesn't it? I mean, have you guys ever been on a long car trip? It's a blast, right? Hours and hours and hours in the car. What's the first thing you do? You pack your bags, you get your clothes, you grab your snacks, you grab something to drink, and for heaven's sake, you better grab all the tablets you can get your hands on because those kids are gonna be in the back seat for hours. That sounds about right though, but what did we miss on that list? What's the very first thing we actually did? We planned the trip. That's what came first. And that's what Jesus is talking about now. He's talking about planning your trip. He's talking about your approach to life. It doesn't start with what you're going to eat or drink or wear. 
It starts before then. He says, don't worry about those things. He says, don't stress. Don't be anxious. Don't worry about it. Now, I'm not saying that you're making a bad life decision by bringing along your beef jerky and your Game Boy when you go on your trip, especially if you have the Game Boy with a little magnifier on it. You better bring those along. And if it means my wife's sanity, you better believe that I'm going to grab all the tablets I can get my hands on, as well as the half a dozen backup chargers that we have, because those things are not going to die while we're on a trip. But there's a difference between being prepared for the trip and worrying about it. There's a difference between being prepared for a job interview and worrying about it. There's a difference between being prepared for that big math test you have coming up and worrying about it. There's a difference between being prepared and worrying. What Jesus is saying here is don't worry. Trust me first and the rest will fall into place. Because really, what good does worrying do? How does it help? What does it solve? I think we all know the answer deep down inside. It doesn't solve the thing. Life's answers are not found in worrying about life. Life's answers are found in seeking God first. It's easier said than done though, right? Does anybody here worry? Anybody? Just me? Okay, there's a few of you out there. You are my people. I worry. I worry a lot. Some of them may seem like worldly problems. I worry about work. By day, I'm a banker. I play with people's money all day long. But I worry about work. I worry about hitting my goals. I worry about getting my assignments done on time. I worry about getting my assignments done correctly. I'm, I'm affecting people's lives. Some of my worries sound justified. I worry about providing for my family. I worry about spending time with my family, balancing that work-life relationship. I worry about mowing the lawn. I worry about finding time to fix the mower so I can mow the lawn. Some of my worries seem completely righteous. As I mentioned before, I'm the director here of Guest Experience. One of our goals as a church is to remove any and all unnecessary barriers to people coming to Christ any unnecessary barriers. In my role, that falls largely on me out here out front. I worry about staffing efficiently. I worry about having enough volunteers, bridge builders as we call them, to fill those spots. I worry about being ready for my next meeting. I worry that one Sunday I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna forget to do something. And that one thing was a barrier to someone coming to Jesus. And that comes back and that falls on me. That's my fault. That's on me. That's what I worry about. What about you? What do you worry about? Whether or not you're a follower of Jesus, there's a really good chance that one of the things on my list is probably on your list too. It's interesting though, looking back at our verse here, knowing that our lives would be full of these tons of stressors, in this verse, Jesus didn't mention work. He didn't mention family. He didn't mention money or home. Food, water, and clothing. In talking about where to focus our priorities, Jesus went back to the very basics of life. And what did he say about them? Don't worry about it. Don't worry about them. And then he goes on to give us a nice 10-point outline on how to overcome worry in a stressful world. No, he doesn't do that. It would have been nice if he would have done that. It would have made life a whole lot easier. What Jesus actually does at this point is pretty interesting. He goes and he draws a line in the sand, figuratively. Remember, at this point, he has thousands of followers, people following him around, wandering around the countryside. They're watching what he does. They're listening to what he says. They're hoping to catch a glimpse at one of these miracles they keep hearing about. And he draws a line in the sand. He says, guys, I appreciate you following me around, but it's not enough. If you're going to truly be my followers, you actually have to seek me. This is how he says it in verse 32. He says, for the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. 
Okay, so bear with me for a second. This was written 2,000 years ago. So it's pretty easy to read this one little verse, kind of nod and glaze over it and keep going on with your life. But if you put this verse into the context of its time, Jesus just threw down the gauntlet. His audience, for the most part at this point, is the Jews, the people of Israel. For 4,000 years, these are the people that have been told over and over and over again, you are the chosen people of God. The Torah, the Bible of their time, is about their people. The stories that they've heard for thousands of years, the bedtime stories they've heard about these heroes of the, of, of the Bible, that's their people. That's their stories. When it comes to God, these guys are supposed to be at the top of the list. And in verse 32, Jesus takes that list and he draws a line and he throws the Gentiles into the mix. Now, in the eyes of the Jews, this was a big deal. Not because of the who the people of Israel were necessarily, but because of who the Gentiles were. Simply put, they were everybody else. Here we had the people of Israel, the chosen people of God. Here we had the Gentiles, not the chosen people of God. In the eyes of the Jews, we had the heroes, the heroes of all those stories in the Bible. Over here, these were the bad guys in most of those stories, the guys they were fighting against, the guys that killed their ancestors. These people were taught to believe in God. Over here, they didn't know who God was. The people of Israel were up here, and the Gentiles were down here. So with that mindset, with that background, let's take another look at what he says. He says, don't worry about saying what you will eat, what you will drink, or what we will wear. For the Gentiles eagerly seek these things, and your Heavenly Father knows that you need them. In other words, what he's saying is, what are you seeking? Who are you? Aren't you the people of God? Because if you really were my people, you wouldn't be worried about all this other stuff. That's, that's what the Gentiles worry about. You've been taught for thousands and thousands of years. Follow me. Your God has provided for you time and time again as you have remained faithful. So what are you seeking? Why are you worrying about all this other stuff? What are you seeking? How many of us find us in that same situation? Not so much the Israelites versus the Gentiles, but the them versus the me. My neighbor just got a new truck. Must be nice. I could pull the church trailer using that truck. I'm going to seek after that for me. You hear about Joe at work? Joe just got a promotion. Came with a nice pay raise. Lots of recognition. I'm going to seek after that for me. Now, those things aren't necessarily bad. A new car, success at work, a growing savings account. None of those things are bad in and of themselves. What happens, though, is it's too easy to make those little things the priorities in our lives, to make those the goals. We tell ourselves, if I don't make that the priority, if I don't seek that out, it's never going to happen for me. It's at those points in our lives though, where Jesus draws that line in the sand for us. What is your priority going to be? Whose side are you going to be on? Just like Jesus asked his followers, are you going to be like the Gentiles and eagerly seek the things of the world? If so, if that becomes a priority, what is it that we're pushing aside? If I'm going to go after that new truck, it's going to take some more time, some more money. I'll spend a little less time at home to make sure that happens for me. I want to seek that out. That new promotion at work sounds like it's nice, but it means working weekends now. That's okay. I'll just I'll skip church. It's not a big deal. I don't see any other way around it. That's what I have to do to get it done. And that's the problem. I don't see any other way around it. It's our perspective. It's our point of view. I mean, because really, if I don't do it, how else is it supposed to happen? It's at that point where we've crossed that line in the sand that we've told God, no, 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 it's okay, it's okay, God, you take a break, I've got it from here, I can control things. It's at that point where we've decided that our way must be right. Because really, how can God make it happen otherwise? It's at that point, as difficult as it may seem, we've forgotten the second half of verse 32. He says, for the Gentiles eagerly seek these things. 
And your heavenly Father, he knows that you need them. As hard as it is to think about sometimes, God knows what our worries are. He knows what our struggles are. And as tough as it might be, he has a plan. There is a divine order in everything. And as messy and as confusing as our life might be, God knows. He is in control. He knows what you need and what I need better than anybody else. And as opposed to making us suffer through these decisions alone, he has painted a clear path. He's told us how we can find the right answers and seek the right thing. He says, but first seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. Seek first the kingdom of God. Now, I know this is one of those verses that gets thrown around a lot. You've probably seen it on a few t-shirts, on some bumper stickers. It becomes a catchphrase. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Seek God. It'll all be okay. Don't stress about it. Simple enough, right? But when you really think about it, when you personalize it, it gets a whole lot, a whole lot tougher. Before I go after that new truck, I better seek God. Before I seek out that promotion at work, I better seek God first. Before I, whatever it is, whatever it is for you, fill in the blank. Before I do that, I need to make sure that I'm seeking God first. You may ask, why? Rob, are you saying that if I don't seek it out, seek God first, that I won't be successful in this life? Truthfully, no. I'm not saying that at all. I think we can all think of plenty of examples out there in the world of people that have been successful according to the terms of this world that have no idea who God is and have no idea what God's righteousness even looks like. What about them? How are they successful? And to be honest, it's all the things I mentioned before. It's hard work, long hours, extra money, extra time. If your goal is to be successful according to the definition of the world, then yes, those things will get you there and you will be successful. And as fruitful and as meaningful as that might feel in the short term, in the long term, that is all going to fade away because those aren't the things that matter. If your goal is to be successful on an eternal basis, the path that you'll take changes drastically. Have you guys ever seen Indiana Jones? Yes. Indiana Jones. One of the best movie franchises out there. There are four Indiana Jones movies, rumored that there's a fifth one coming out. So I don't don't know about that one yet. And the fourth one we don't talk about because it had Shia LaBeouf in it. Um, So the third one is Indiana Jones and The Last Crusade, by far my favorite of of the first three. The whole premise of this movie is that Indiana Jones, uh, stop right here, it's been out a while, so if you haven't seen it, I'm not worried about spoilers, it's on you. Um, Indiana Jones is kind of fighting against the Nazis. Nazis are searching for the Holy Grail, the cup that supposedly caught the blood of Christ at the cross. And it's rumored that this cup will... um, Lost my train of thought. It's rumored that the cup, whoever drinks from the cup will have eternal life. They'll live forever. So in this scene, in Indiana Jones, he's looking for it just for what it is, for its value of being the cup that caught the blood of Christ. The Nazis want it so they can make their army powerful and take over the world. So there's a scene where they all come into one room, and the wall is lined with different cups and bowls and plates and chalices, And the knight that's standing there with the sword guarding it says, you've got to choose which one. But choose wisely. Because the right one will bring you eternal life. The wrong one will bring you death. To make a very long scene short, Nazis go first. They go up and down the wall, and they choose this cup. The most beautiful, ornate cup that they can find. Gems, gold, diamonds. This, this must be the cup of the king. He drinks out of it, and I will leave out the gory details, but he's dead really quick. Indiana Jones goes back, takes the cup, and he looks for the most humble cup that he can find. And he says, this one, this one must be the cup of a carpenter. 
and it looks a whole lot different than the other. And of course, he was right, and he lives on forever, which is why they're still making movies about him. Um, but looking at those two cups, there's a difference from the world, world's perspective of what power and honor and glory looks like, beautiful, ornate gold cup, versus the humble standards of God. So it's left to us. There's man's perspective and God's perspective, and we're left to choose wisely. So looking back at our passage, it's not an accident that God shows food, water, and clothing to talk about. As humans, we're designed to seek after those things. We need those things in order to survive. As spiritual beings, though, we're designed to seek out so much more. Life's answers are found in seeking God first. More important than seeking out a way to survive in this life is seeking out God's plan for our eternity. He talks about it in the Jeremiah. In Jeremiah, he says, For I know the plans I have for you. This is the Lord's declaration. Plans for your well-being, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. God has your best interests in mind. And while you might find temporary happiness and success in this life, he has plans for your future and your hope that you can't even begin to imagine. So what's God's plan for you? How do you find it? How do you know what it is? How do you see past the distractions of this life and ensure that you're seeking God first? There's a well-known saying that says, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. You've got to take a risk at some point. Some of you might know my wife, Randy. She's awesome. Randy has what you may call a refined palate. Others of you may call her a picky. Others may, you may, may define the word picky with Randy. And that's okay. It makes eating out with her interesting. Randy, if you know her though, Randy absolutely loves Dr. Pepper. Some of you are friends, yes. Dr. Pepper has a special place in Randy's heart. Now, she loves it so much that if we were to sit down, there, there are some fakes out there, if you've heard of this. There's quite a few. I was, I was surprised at this picture. There's another one that had about 50 cans, but you couldn't see what it was because the picture was so big. But there are so many imitation Dr. Peppers out there. If you blindfolded Randy and put down one of these, all of these in front of her and had her sip, I am completely confident that she would tell you which one's Dr. Pepper, without even a doubt. She knows what Dr. Pepper is. She's experienced Dr. Pepper. She's had it before. She knows Dr. Pepper. But think about it. At some point in her past, Randy had never had Dr. Pepper before. She'd heard about it. She'd heard rumors about this miraculous drink that existed out there. But she'd never tasted it. She'd never experienced it. But now, she knows what Dr. Pepper is. There's not a doubt in her mind. She's tasted it. She's lived to Dr. Pepper. She's experienced it. Now, some of you may be in that similar boat. I've heard of God. I don't really know him, though. I've never experienced it. I've never tasted anything having to do with God. I've heard rumors about it. And if that's you... I have good news for you. If you're sitting right here in the pews today, if you're watching online, you have taken that first step. You've taken your first sip. The first step is the hardest. And now I challenge you, don't stop there. It gets better. You might be out there feeling feelings of joy, excitement. You may be thirsty because I mentioned Dr. Pepper. That wasn't intentional. You may have questions, of, questions and a little bit of confusion, not sure what to do next. If that describes you, we have what's called the next steps table in the back. You'll see the big sign over on this side. Stop there after the service. We want to make sure that we can help you on your journey. As you've exited that fork in the road and taken a step down this path, we're there to help guide you and help you there. Now, seeking God is a lifelong journey, and it gets better as you go. If you're already on that journey, or maybe at some point you were, you were on the journey and you took a little side path and you're looking at getting back over. If that's you, you don't have to journey alone either. One of our goals as a church 
is to make sure that we are walking with others into a growing relationship with Christ. So we're walking with others. We're not perfect by any means. I mentioned before I had a long list of worries, and that was only a small part of it. We're still working on ourselves. And wherever you're at in your relationship with God, we want to walk with you. We do that through our church family. We also do that through what we call city groups. Or during the week, we actually meet in people's homes, and we do life together. We read the Bible. We share experiences. We share some pains. And we pray for each other. We do life together. Whichever one of those describes you, though, this is what you need as you continue on your path with God. If you want to know who God is, if you want to taste it, if you want to experience it, you need to read his book. You need to see what he taught. And it's found here in the pages of the Bible. George Mueller was an evangelist back in the 1800s. And this is what he said in talking about the importance of the Bible. He said, God is the author of the Bible. And only the truth it contains will lead to true happiness. He's exactly right. God's word will lead you to happiness and fulfillment in this life on a spiritual level. Spend time in it daily. Let his word guide you as you continue down that path and continually seek him. Now, in addition to to reading the Bible, he's also provided a resource of what we call prayer. As you go through life, as you study the Bible, as you struggle with worry, whatever situation you're in, God is there through it all. You can go directly to him. What did Jesus say about life struggles in Matthew? He said, don't worry. Seek God. It'll all be all right. Paul tells us the same thing in his letter to the Philippians. He says, don't worry about anything, but in, through prayer, but in everything, that's important, but in everything, through prayer and, supplica- and, through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. There it is again. Don't worry. Seek God, and it'll all be all right. What does the Bible verse say? He said, when do we seek God? In everything. In home, in work, in family, in money, in everything, seek God. And not only does it say that it will be all right, he says the peace of God will come over you. As Paul puts it, a peace that surpasses all understanding. Can, can you imagine a peace that huge? It surpasses your understanding? By definite, you can't. It says it surpasses your understanding. You can't even imagine how peaceful it's going to be. And how do you find that peace? Does it say by working harder, you'll find that peace? By buying that new truck, you'll have that peace? No. The peace of God will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. As I shared before, 20 years ago, I couldn't even begin to imagine a peace like that. After I had given up and not even chosen which path to go on down those, those forks in the road, eventually I started going to church with my fiancé. And my life changed. I started to feel something. I didn't know what it was, but I liked it. So I kept going. At one point I decided, you know what? If this is right, I need to test this against what I used to know. So on a a given Sunday, I prayed. I prayed. I said, God, I'm going to go to both churches, and you need to tell me which one is right. Because I don't know for myself. I I, I got a hint, but I don't know. Make it obvious, please. So I went to church with my fiancé, and there was... I couldn't tell you what the sermon was about, except I know Jesus was talked about. I felt peace, I felt joy, I felt calm. I experienced God there. I went to lunch, went to the other church. I can tell you that church was not about Jesus in that message. And there were feelings of uneasiness, doubt, confusion, awkwardness. This is the church I grew up in. And I realized all those feelings that I was experiencing, they had all been there. My entire life, they had been there. I just didn't know. 
But now, now that I had tasted this, and that's not Dr. Pepper. This is where I'm supposed to be. This is what I want. This is what I want to seek after. So that's my story. What about you? Do you know what you're... I can't see my notes now, sorry. <laughs> uh. So what are you seeking? Do you know what you're seeking? If you're seeking fame, money, success, I, if you really work hard at it, you will find all those things. But right along with it, you will find worry, anxiety, doubt, and stress. But if you're seeking happiness and peace, peace that is so deep it's beyond your understanding, your path is going to take you down a different road. But one of the hardest parts about seeking God is knowing where to begin. We've taken the first step. I've given you a few options as second and third steps. But as you read the Bible, which page do I start on? Do I start at the beginning? Do I start somewhere else? There's not necessarily a wrong or right answer. The whole thing is really good. But starting this summer as a church, we're going to be reading through the book of Mark together as a church. This is an awesome time for you to join us. If you're not sure where to start, start with the book of Mark. So starting next week, the book of Mark is uh, 16 chapters long. Conveniently, it will be a 16-week course. That's about a 16, that's about one chapter a day if I did my math correctly, or one chapter a week, sorry. You can read one chapter a day, that's fine. But I would like to personally invite you to join us. Whether you're here in person or online, it doesn't matter. You can join us in those studies. We have some resources that we're going to give to you. Um, this is one of them here. So this is the book of Mark, and you can't see it from there, but inside there are lines for notes. So as you study, um, take advantage of this, and, and as you study on your own, as you come to church and you hear the sermons on Sundays, use this book to keep track of your notes. Keep track of what God is telling you as you seek Him. To break it down even more, the book of Mark has 660 verses in it. That's about six verses a day. It's a very small price to pay for the potential peace and happiness that is beyond your comprehension. So as we've discussed today, there are a lot of different paths out there. There's a lot of different directions you can go. The world, as we all know, has its own version of what joy and success looks like. But God's word tells us over and over and over again that life's answers are found in seeking God first. Let's go ahead and pray. God, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for direction. Thank you for your care and love. The world is a confusing, confusing place out there, God, and we just can't do it alone. There are doubts. There are questions. There are times where we just feel so lost we don't know what to do. I pray, God, that in those times that we would gravitate towards you, that we would grab hold of your word, that we would grab hold of your truth, and that in each of those circumstances that we would seek you and that we would find you. God, I pray that you would make our paths clear. I pray that you would help us distinguish between the world's way and your way, God, and guide our steps as we seek you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
time that we set aside each week to worship through giving. Now, if this is your first time here and you're just checking us out, seeing what we're all about, you are in no way obligated to give. In fact, you're tuned in to a gathering of folks who give so generously that you're not obligated to. Now, if you'd like to give online, there are a couple of ways that you can do that. The first is by clicking on the Give icon, or in the CityWalk app, you can click on Give at the very bottom and you'll be able to give from there. Now, if at any point in time during tonight's message, you made a decision to start or re-engage in a relationship with Jesus, we are so happy and excited for you. And if you'd like to talk to someone about that decision, all you need to do is just click on the Make a Decision button right above me, fill out some basic information, and one of us will be in contact with you shortly afterwards. And if you've missed out on any part of tonight's message, or you'd like to go back and see any of our past messages, all you need to do is click on the past messages icon or go to citywalkchurch.com and you'll be able to watch any of the past messages from there. With that being said, we are so excited that you joined us tonight and we look forward to seeing you next week at 6 p.m. at live.citywalknow.com. With that being said, look forward to seeing you all next week. Have a great day.